I need some technology expert to make there this. Go. Okay. Hold on. What do I push? You there? just press the. Sorry. Boom. No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, there we go. One. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, one of the things that strikes me as really remarkable about this film is that everything that you see here represents a technological reality that is maybe five years away or maybe a little bit closer, it sort of depends. Uh, there's a, a, a small ISR drone that plays a very pivotal role in this movie and um, uh, if, if you didn't know that uh, we are working with small, extremely small drones like that right now. I'd like to introduce you to Morton, who's going to demonstrate something for us today. In terms of off-the-shelf capability, uh, this is kind of the cutting edge right now. This is called the Black Hornet. Uh, this, he's demonstrating here today for the first time ever an alpha version of the uh, Fox Dynamics Black Hornet that is capable of flying uh, not uh, on GPS, but entirely inside, based on uh, image recognition of contrast. And as you can see, uh, it really does work. So everything that you saw in this movie is very close to reality as it exists right now. Um, it's got a battery life of about 25 minutes. It can fly for about a kilometer. And there it is right there. So this is the future that you just saw that's here today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit to Gavin, and then I'm going to open it up for some questions. And when I say questions, they, they should definitely actually be questions. Uh, this is not statement time. Uh, I'm not Jefferson, neither are you. So we're going to limit our questions to about 30 seconds, and we're going to move on because we have a very limited amount of time to get through them. Uh, but first, I, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, Gavin, that I thought was pretty fascinating. Now, this uh, this film is it, one of the key elements of it is decision. It's a really important decision uh, that the uh, all the characters are faced with. Who here is familiar with the trolley problem? Raise your hand if you know what that is. It's about five or six people. Uh, so in psychology, the trolley problem uh, is it's a psychological construct first proposed by Filipina Foote in 1967. And it asks yourself this question, is the, is the premise of it. Imagine that you've got five people uh, that are stuck on a train track, and a train is hurtling, uh, a trolley is hurtling towards them. You're in a control booth, you can pull a lever, and you can divert that train, and then it's only the, the train's only going to strike one person. Do you pull the lever, divert the train, strike the one person, and spare the five? Now, when asked this, 89% of people say yes. They pull the lever, they divert the train, they hit the one, they save the five. When you modify that problem a little bit, and instead of just pulling the lever, you actually have to push person onto the track, only 11 people will elect to do that. And that's sort of fascinating, and that's where we're going to start off today, because uh, in the situation that you set up, the drone operator is the person that is in charge of actually pushing the person, and everybody else in the movie gets to just pull the lever. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so first, I'm going to give a talk a little bit about how you approach that problem and generally even how we in the military can approach this problem a little bit better. And perhaps talk a little bit about how maybe your own point of view on this changed as we begin to examine this problem from the perspective of different characters. Well, we're just good for soft stuff. Um, <laughs> it is one of the questions. I have to uh, um, be an ex-lawyer in one of my strange previous lives. And this is one of the questions that law students are also asked in ethics classes and so on. Um, you know, it's one thing to pull a lever and divert a train into a point. It's another thing if you're standing on that bridge, you know, you put your hands on another human being, push them off the bridge in front of the train. You're still trading one life for five. Why does it feel so different? And if you still say you would do one for five, will you jump off the bridge in front of the train and say five? Oh, you wouldn't? The five are your kids. The point of the thought experiment is, is simply to demonstrate that if you change facts slightly, you can have a very different outcome. 
And therefore, it is absolutely imperative that you really consider the particular problem before you and, and before you start speaking in generalizations. And the reason that's so interesting in this movie is because there's a tremendous debate out there right now. It's like, are drones good or are drones bad? Well, one thing I loved about Guy Hibbert's script when I read it was he, he presented a particular scenario from multiple points of view. And I hope that was good for you in the movie. At moments in the, in the, when I was reading the script, I thought I knew what I would do. And then I'd turn a page and I'd suddenly wonder if I really was sure of what I would do. But the point of, of, of your, 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 your question is this. If you would pull the trigger and take the life, and there's no right answer to this, take an innocent life to save potentially 80 lives, not definite, that's also important. Well, let's just change the numbers. Let's make it 40. Let's make it five. It, it's, it's just an impossible game to play, right? So then the question becomes, can we draw any general principles from this? And there are many people who are promoting drones, as the general and I were talking about earlier. Um, and, and by the way, it's very important, and I think the general will back me up on this, that there is not one view in the military. What I love about talking to people in the military is that there is actually a democratic process and exchange of ideas going on. And that's actually refreshing. So let's take that as a, a good thing. But there are some in the military who say, these drones are the latest and greatest. They're pinpoint accurate. They will take out a target with great precision. And this is what we should be backing. And this will solve our problem. Well, at every stage of, in the evolution of warfare, you know, there's been some new technological advance. At first, we fought on the battlefield with, you know, bows and arrows, I mean, with uh, spears, and then someone invented a longbow. And people said, that's not cricket. You can't be shooting me from over there. That's just not done. And then, you know, we invented the tank. And, and every, so the, the point of this rather long-winded statement is that the drone is a new technological weapon, and we should not confuse a weapon that can be used tactically for certain things with an overall strategy. So what I want to say about the script is I don't want anyone to think that we are presenting a scenario that applies to all drones, all, to all operations. This is a particular operation with a particular set of facts that we deliberately created in order to generate conversations about many things, whether the propaganda, what's the blowback effect, what is the effect on drone pilots, and to try and demystify drone warfare a little bit for our audience, but not to tell you what to think. I don't know if that answers your question. I think so. But in that question, we're in charge of holding this lever, making this decision a lot. How can we now begin to make this decision a little bit better? Are we empowered at all by technology to do that? Hold your microphones a little bit farther from your mouth. Further from my mouth. I'm talking right now. Yeah, you're popping a lot, both of you. I don't know if she's that bad. Thank you. With the evolution of warfare, two things to consider. Uh, before the wall came down, warfare was largely linear, and uh, there was no issue, there was no real decision-making apparatus uh, to, uh, to declare shoot or no shoot. If the Warsaw Pact were to come across the inter-German border, we in NATO, uh, the, the enemy was clearly defined and the instructions were very clear. Uh, when the wall came down, we then went to a battlefield that was not linear, and at the same time, we had this very rapid growth in technology that delivered weapon systems. And in the military, uh, we, our tactics, techniques, and procedures, our doctrine is always a step behind industry delivering a, a new weapon. So you deliver a new weapon, and we in the military try to figure out how we're going to best employ that weapon. And our guiding principles are rules of engagement. Rules of engagement during the Cold War, during the uh, defense of, uh, of NATO countries, was very simple. Rules of engagement today, and uh, you know, we, we have so many examples of where warfare is, is not clearly defined, the enemy is not clearly known, and uh, we have weapons at our disposal that must be managed in a way by the rules of engagement to minimize, and I'm, I'm not fond of the term, collateral damage, which is killing of innocents. And uh, it's what the film is all about. It's, 
It's how do you avoid the killing of an innocent, and how do you decide how to pull the trigger? Very simple during the Warsaw Pact. When you saw a uniformed member of the Warsaw Pact, and uh, he, was, he was clearly the enemy and the rules of engagement authorized you as a NATO member to kill another human being. Uh, today, far more complex. Drone warfare and drone technology is another leap forward technologically that, uh, that we're all struggling with, and rules of engagement are, are driving the, the ethics, if I could use that term, or the morality, if I could even use that term, in the prosecution of warfare. So um, I'm going to open it up for some questions from the audience before I do. Let me also say that Morton is going to be around later if any of you want to take a look at the entirely like new version of the Black Hornet that's on display here today. In the meantime, um, yes, go ahead. So, so we know. Thank you. So, so we know of many actual real world, world cases where the target was not identified where the target could have been easily captured, and where the target was not any sort of imminent threat of mass murder. Do you know of a single real world case where all three of those conditions, as in this fictional case, were actually met? Because imminent threat has been redefined by the Justice Department to be virtually meaningless. And here you give us this fictional, actual imminent threat. I'm sure the military loves this film, but could they give you a real world example that remotely resembled this? Couldn't, couldn't be captured, really couldn't be captured, and was about to kill a lot of people, honest to God, imminent threat, and identified the target. It's an outstanding question, and you're quite right. And it, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I can give you a scenario exactly the same as in the film. And to the question of whether the military loves this film, we've been fortunate, and I hope this is the, the case, that people in the military like the film, they don't all love it, and people within Amnesty International like the film, they don't all love it, and what the purpose of this film is to generate exactly that conversation. Is because to pretend that this situation will never exist also doesn't help you. Has it ever? Has it ever? In my experience, I'm not in the military enough to know. So I, I, but, I, there are not, but, but there are enough military people dealing with suicide bombing vests and so suicide bombings are real. So I, don't, I think we have to discuss the principle. Your point is very, very well taken. Your answer is no. Not that I know of that's exactly like this, no, no. But does that, the, the, is your th thesis then that the whole drone program is completely... Um, it's counterproductive. Every time one oh, of the top officials retires, he starts talking about how it's counterproductive and they're producing more enemies than you're killing. Stop doing it. But the people who haven't retired yet won't say that. Well, I would like to, I would like to argue that that's exactly the point of the film. The question is the cost of war and whether there are costs that outweigh the strategic, what, what is the strategy? So let's go back to the strategy, because your point is completely correct. Um, let's look at this particular scenario. There's a certain moment in the movie where they, uh, Colonel Powell feels she's manipulated the data enough to feel that she can get a yes to strike. And the Under Secretary of State for Africa, the woman in Cobra, says, I still don't want to strike. And she makes the argument, contrary to our expectation, because she seems to have been very maternal at this point, that she would rather Al-Shabaab killed 80 people and was blamed for that attack than that our forces killed one innocent person. So this is a Trojan horse film, if you like. In order to have, so if I present the argument that you've presented, that this can never happen, this is the scenario that people try to promote in order to be sure of using drones. I would argue that let's have the conversation. The question that comes out of this, should we use it? And secondly, what do you think the father of that child is going to think of us? What is the greatest strategy? What is the strategy? The weapon is a tactic. In a perfect scenario like this, it may be useful. But in many, many other scenarios, if you take the life of an innocent person, even in this perfect scenario, to actually argue the opposite of your point, here's a perfect scenario. Should we take that innocent life? And even in the so-called perfect scenario, what are the long-term implications? What do you think that local community is going to think of us? I mean, this gives a, I want to give you one other final example of this question. Now, I see you shaking your head, and I know exactly why. But I beg you to understand that, there, that, 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 that reprieve 
Amnesty International, all feel in this conversation, you can't persuade the other side without giving them their scenario. Here's their scenario. Were we right to use this weapon? Are we a police force? We're at the intersection of warfare and policing. We're at the intersection of warfare and policing. If this is the, if this is the tactic, is it okay if that Hellfire missile is put through a roof in your neighborhood and your kid is on the street? How do you think that father reacts? So what we're trying to do is, I, I think you feel that we haven't presented enough of the other side. The only way to present the other side is to deny that this scenario could exist. It can exist. It does exist. It's a fantasy. Okay. It's, okay. A, it's a fantasy. All right. It's a fair point. Right. I don't think it's a fantasy, but I'll go look for real world examples for you. That's a fair point. We're going to go up to the back now. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Kader Pavi. I'm covering this for Popular Mechanics. I had a question for uh, uh, Norton, and I have a question for uh, you, Gavin, yeah. and uh, Jenna Leaven as well. Um, today, we had the, I guess we heard news from the Pentagon that there was a drone strike and a soft operation. In don't go, don't go. I want to keep this guy. Don't go, don't go. You both stay. Don't go, don't go. It's important. Don't go. Uh, yeah. We had a, wait, don't go. Here. We heard news uh, for today from the Pentagon that there was a drone strike and a soft, so a special operations uh, operation in Somalia today that killed 150, uh, uh, so, uh, supposedly killed 150 uh, Al Shabaab yeah. terrorists. Uh, I was hoping you can comment on that operation specifically. And for Norton, uh, I guess I had a question on the device you presented earlier. Was that uh, is that specifically deployed to the military currently, or um, is it? Did there plans to be deployed? Uh, thank you. Well. Uh, more than you want, yeah, you want it, yeah. The answer is yes, it is currently deployed. But yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Morten from Norway. Uh, the answer is uh, yes. The uh, UAVs has been in use in Afghanistan for four years by the British Army. And we also had some um, numbers here in the US to the US Army and the Marine Corps. So, yes. So I wish our gentleman had not left, it's a pity, and I totally understand his frustration. But a scenario very similar to this just played out in San Bernardino. If that drone, if the push is to have drones hovering over us for permanent security, such as is the case that's happening in Pakistan, how do you think that local population feels? And is that Hellfire missile justifiable? That's the point of the movie. I'm not trying to justify that scenario. I'm giving you a scenario and asking you what you think. I don't say this is right. I think there's plenty of arguments in this movie that argue for what is the strategy. But personally, I absolutely could see a situation where that L5 missile might be justified. But I think it's something that we have to back off from and think about very carefully. So I do wish he hadn't left, because he makes a very good point. But we can't pretend that by taking this scenario out completely, we're not going to have another San Bernardino or suicide bombings. I mean, that's just fantasy, too. So, yeah. Um, who should we go to? Hi. Um, so the role of the lawyer plays very prominently yeah. in this film. So I'm curious for you, Gavin, as an ex-lawyer, and John Eaton, nice to see you um, uh, in your command, kind of what you uh, what your perception was of the role of the lawyer in enabling you or holding you back uh, from your mission and uh, kind of what, how you see, see the, the role of the lawyer playing out. I mean, I will say as, as a lawyer, I'm, I find lawyers somewhat annoying, but um, I also can see a value uh, in terms of promotion of the rule of law. In this case, uh, commanders are, are given the guidance, write your own rules of engagement, validate them with your lawyer. And uh, lawyers are by nature conservative in the military, probably everywhere else, because their, their role is to keep everybody out of trouble. And, their and by out of trouble, do you mean the danger of being accused of a war crime? Correct. Yeah. Correct. And so you write your rules of engagement, and you, you have the, the legal system and your lawyer validate that you got it right. And when you say rules of engagement, that is when to pull the trigger, be it from a drone or from a rifle. Uh, in Somalia, years ago, we had a problem. Uh, we were, in 92-93, we were uh, uh, there to, to, to bring order to, to a, a, a problematic country. And one of the engagements that we had was 
warlords putting women and children in front of their formation, advancing on a U.S. formation. And shoot or no shoot. It's a, it's a terrible dilemma to the, uh, to, to the defending force, to the, to the U.S. force. And you, you then go through the decision cycle of what am I going to gain by engaging, because you're definitely going to have uh, innocent casualties if you engage. But if the American force can retire from the battlefield without shooting, if they are not going to be taken under attack, and if their mission is not going to be compromised, if they are not going to have to surrender another vulnerable force to what's advancing, then you can retire without killing innocents. And it's, but it's this decision cycle that you go through, and we play scenarios, and we war game the, the what-ifs of the world. And again, to Gavin's point about this film, it is a scenario. I think this film ought to be seen by everybody in the national security complex of the United States, certainly in state, certainly in defense, and certainly in the uh, National Security Council, because it presents the dilemma of what is the right answer Short-term gain with possible long-term loss, exactly. which is what's going on right now with drone warfare in Pakistan. We are, we are committing decisions, we are making decisions that achieve short-term gains and sometimes long-term gains, but frequently it's short-term gains and long-term losses as we destroy innocence and, you know, that in, in, in the words of one division commander in Iraq to his men at the end of every day, did you create more insurgents today than you took off the battlefield? And that's the question. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, okay. So sorry. We're going to go yes. <laughs> uh, back up here. Um, all right. Air Force, okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Philip Swartz. I'm a reporter with the uh, Air Force Times. The Air Force has started to hire private contractors to conduct some uh, drone flights. They're limiting it at the moment to, uh, to ISR, to intelligence flights. Um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on any... That's what they're telling people. Right. I mean, your thoughts on any ethical concerns going forward in that potential scenario. Into um, outsourcing military strikes to defense, to contractors who are not actually military personnel. Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, my thoughts are um, it's uh, very worrying, and I'll tell you why. I mean, you know, I, there's the argument that you should go back to a draft. There's many in the military who would hate that. Because the more we, and general may not agree with me, I don't know, but when there's a draft, your population is, far, I'm not suggesting you would like that, I'm not even suggesting it's a very good thing, I'm just saying when there's a draft, like in the Vietnam War, the population goes, hey, wait a minute, is this something I really want to be involved in? Right now, we have a military that consists of way, a tiny percentage of the whole population, and the more you outsource this to contractors, the more you remove the direct participation of your democratic society in the decision to go to war. Um, so I think it's, I don't have a good answer. I know why it's happened. It's the same reason as why they're pumping drone warfare is the best idea because our forces aren't injured. Um, but the question is, if our forces don't have something to lose, is there a danger of us going to war more easily because the stakes are not the same for us? And if we go to war easily, do we do what the general's saying, where going to war more easily, pulling the trigger more easily, may result ironically, which I wish you'd say, in a blowback. And the general's question is exactly right. And I do believe the film talks about that. It says, here's the truck. Look, here's a scenario that really, we should pull the trigger, shouldn't we? And the whole world's going, pull the trigger. And then he goes, should we pull the trigger? And one of the characters gives you an argument that says, well, if you pull the trigger, this is possibly the consequence. So you can't focus on the drone. You've got to focus on the overall strategy. By the end, you want to know the cost of war? An innocent child is dead, and what do you think her father's going to feel? And what do you think all of his friends are going to feel? So these are not touchy-feely things. You tee it up by giving you a situation where you want to pull the trigger. You're fired up. 
And then you pull the rug out from it. If, 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 if that isn't coming, think, well, I feel bad for him. But that seems to be how most people see the movie. You know, if you're going to trade one life, one innocent life for 20, I got accused today, by the way, of the opposite, which is you made her cute and the little girl, and that would never happen, and you know it would be a bad guy. And really, <laughs> today the administration announced that they're going to tell us at some point who the innocents are that have been lost in this battle. Right, Patrick, you know more about it than I do, but uh, yes, and it was uh, exactly as Martin Luther King described. Yes. An announcement today that at some point we're going to begin to learn about the. Uh, uh, Affects the actual targets of different drone strikes and the collateral damage that has resulted from that. It was a uh, uh, somebody at the Presidential Security Council, yeah. and uh, we don't know when exactly that's going to come out. We don't exactly know why, but uh, it was a bold statement about something that's going to happen in the future: an actual accounting of uh, the collateral and the actual ramifications of U.S. drone strikes. We're going to uh, find out more, I think, altogether, but. Uh, let me bring that to uh, General Eaton because I think you bring up a really interesting point. We're going to move uh, around a little bit. Is there something addictive politically about uh, the ability to strike targets from the removed far away that you see as uh, particularly symbolic of the way we're going to commit more and more war in the future? And how do we preserve that tactical advantage in a way that um, actually speaks to uh, how? As a, as a military ethically we should be operating. Is there something politically addictive about drone warfare right now? What do we do about it? Uh, thank you. First, I'm going to go back to violence is a monopoly of the state. Contractors should not be killing. Contractors can do any number of things on the battlefield. They should not be killed. That is a, that is a, and must be a monopoly of the state. And that's our policemen, and that's our soldiers. So the, to the draft, uh, my wife will say yes to the draft because all three of her children are soldiers. And uh, we believe that that burden should be shouldered by the entire United States of America. If we're going to go to war, let it be an American decision as opposed to a decision imposed upon 1% of the United States. Now, to your question, the the issue of, restate your question. I, uh, I lost myself here a little bit. Is there something politically addictive? Yes, okay. Uh, painless warfare, I believe, is addictive warfare. If you don't have skin in the game, it's very easy to make a decision. And uh, that goes back to the draft question that Gavin brought up. If you're going to embark upon achieving a foreign policy objective, if you are after an outcome and you're able to use a mechanism that is not going to put an American at risk, but puts the adversary at risk and the people around the adversary at risk, then I think you go down a path that Andrew Basevich, who is a retired uh, uh, armored cavalry colonel, who is now uh, a professor at Boston University. And he wrote a book called Washington Rules. And he goes after this ease with which the United States embarks upon the use of the military to prosecute foreign policy objectives. And part of that is it bears very few effects to the military and almost no effect to the greater population of the United States. So it is seductive. It is addictive. And... Uh, All right. I think that, that, that answers that question. And also to uh, clarify a moment ago, senior White House aide uh, Lisa Monaco, who uh, said that today they were going to release the total number of uh, drone strike victims since 2009. So I don't want to get caught up in a correction. But we're going to go here to... Uh, Thanks very much. It's Anna Mulrain with the Christian Science Monitor. Oh, yeah. Hi there. Uh, I'd love to ask General Eaton, uh, you mentioned your experience in Somalia. No, just if you ever had an ethical situation like this that really came down to the wire, you know, when you think back on your, on your career, you know, what was your toughest ethical decision? And then you were mentioning, it was interesting when you were talking about your process for developing rules of engagement as well. And, 
and that you you guys would kind of come up with these and then run them by your lawyer. And I was I was curious, you know, if you ever kind of drafted an ROE where you felt like, wow, yeah, I really nailed it. Here, I've got it. I've got it all figured out. But just what was that experience like for you? Uh, well, my experience in, in Somalia, I was the operations officer for Army Forces in Somalia, and uh, I, my team wrote the uh, the rules of engagement, put them before the general, and then validated them through the uh, through the lawyer that we had, who happened to be a West Point classmate of mine, and uh, so that's that is how we instructed. All of the uh, U.S. military and those under our command, uh, several other nations, that when you are presented with a, a security dilemma, these are the rules by which you're going to, uh, to operate. And it, they're pretty simple. If you see a Somali unarmed, no issue. If you see a Somali with a rifle, you are now alerted, but you are not to kill him. If you see the Somali deploy his weapon in a way that it appears that he is going to kill you, you are now authorized to kill him. Otherwise, it is a detained uh, approach. So, it, and you realize that we're, the American military, the, the, the youth of America, comes in with a robust belief in our values, in, in our constitution, in our way of life. And they, the only thing they lack is life experience. They come in at the age of 18 or 19, and the only thing they, they don't have is compounded experience. So they're wonderfully bright young men and women. And they, they take what they hear, and they question, and they what if, and they will go through their own scenario of development. So the rules of engagement uh, are fleshed out. The, the greatest problem I had in my career was the development of the Iraqi Armed Forces. And it was my mission in 2003 to reestablish the Iraqi Army. And trying to work through what is easy for a Western democracy raised man or woman is, is difficult when you're dealing with a young man who has been raised in a totalitarian society all his life with all the depredations that, uh, that Saddam perpetrated on his own population. That was the greatest challenge we had on how to inculcate into young Iraqis a, a, a Western thought process in how to use violence to the correct end. Okay, thank you uh, so much, guys. We have time for one more question. Uh, we're gonna go to this gentleman right here, and uh, then we're gonna we're gonna try. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Hoffman, and I'm actually with the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign. And and my question, Gavin, I, I felt there'd be a little uh, round of applause. More, more would be encouraged. But seriously, <laughs> seriously, Gavin, to get to the point. You were a few minutes ago, and this is for the general too. A few minutes ago, Gavin, you were talking about how there is a, uh, the premise of the film is based on uh, thinking about the democratic decision on when to go to war, uh, do we go more easily, the seductive, the addictive, the uh, drone potential, and how easy it is to police the world. Here's the question uh, from a political framework, and your film is embedded, obviously, in an overall political framework. Yeah. When do we go to war? When do we police? Here's the question. Look at the litany of nations that we have our noses stuck in. You know the old uh, point about the camel's nose under the yeah. tent, and then the rest of the camel follows. We're in Iraq, we're in Afghanistan, we're in Syria, we're in Libya, yeah. I could go on. Now, uh, the question is this, why are we policing everywhere? I agree. We're in seven countries. The general and I may not agree on this. I don't think we should be there. I don't think we should have gone into Iraq. I think it was a disaster. I think, but, but this is not what we're asking in this film. And that's, so the question in this film is simple. Will you, or Bernie, or me, trade innocent lives in order to save more innocent lives? That's what this film asks. It's the trolley problem on steroids. It's not, should we be in seven countries? So I'm sorry to be so adamant about it, but answer me that question 
And then we can talk about camels and houses in other countries. Personally, I'm with Thomas Johnson. I think our empire has gotten too big. It's nothing to do with this film. So let's be careful about diving off on our own political little hobby horse and not analyzing the moral and ethical question that is presented by this film. I beg you. Only in Washington, D.C. have I had people try to pop up some other agenda. This film, and I ask you back, what would you do when this fictional situation arises? Will you use this weapon? What is the strategically smart thing to do in this scenario? Should we have invaded Iraq? That's not in this movie. Where's that? Have we created more terrorists by having a drone program of the child in Pakistan? Absolutely, in my view. Do you think kids like living under drones, permanent surveillance? Your question to me privately earlier. They don't. It's a strategic mess. We've taken a tactical weapon that is capable of looking more accurately than a cruise missile before it pulls the trigger, and we've deployed it in ways that may be strategically stupid. That's why I wish he'd stay. Do I think the strategy of using a drone with a Hellfire missile permanently patrolling a population of people in Pakistan is going to help me win the strategic long-term objective, which is to reduce the amount of extremist radical ideology? No, I don't. Will you, I'm asking, if you don't mind, pull the trigger in order to save potentially more lives? And at what point will you? And that is not a question. Yeah, there is evil in yeah. the world everywhere, and we are not to police it. That's the answer. Well, wait, 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 wait. San Bernardino, will you pull a trigger in order to say, now maybe you're a complete pacifist, and I admire that. But that's the question. You're a camel who wants to get all the way under the tent. No, I'm not. I, I just told you I don't. I don't think we should have drones over Pakistan. Be careful. I mean, it's my, my, you want my political views? I'm a Bernie supporter. There you go. I vote Bernie. I think what Donald Trump is doing is strategically dreadful for the security of this nation. I don't particularly like Bernie's love of the Rifle Association on, 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 on the on the on the National Rifle Association the other night. So suck that up. But don't turn this. Don't turn Okay, change his position. I happen to think Bernie is great. But you see how this has become about something else? Yeah. Will you in your moral conscience, at what point can you pull a trigger? Because we're asking young people to do that. So I beg you to take a look at the character of Aaron Paul. Look at the character that he plays. I'll tell you what I think is strategic. Well, I'm, I'm going to answer this point. Because if it's going to get political, let's go there. Come on, let's bring it on. It's important. That's what's great. Let's bring it on. Here's what I don't like. And you're going to be surprised. I'm more on your side than you think. I would argue that the tapes released um, um, that, 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 that the release of those tapes by Snowden, where we hear Air Force pilots talking about those people on the ground as bug splats, is a strategic nightmare for us in terms of winning the long term, winning the long -term objective, which is to reduce radical ideology and conflict. When pilots talk about bug splats instead of human beings, that is wrong. So what is this film a useful discussion for with pilots? It's very useful because the line that Aaron Paul says in the film is actually what they're trying to say. Uh, as the pilot in command of this weapon, I will not release my weapon until you rerun the CDE. Let's be careful that we don't do what we are all complaining about, which is end up in, I'm right, you're wrong, fuck you, and you're wrong. Otherwise, we're Donald Trump, and that's not what Bernie's for. Bernie's for a proper conversation, and with all due respect, that's what this film is about. So answer, answer me. What would you do? I'll tell you what I'd do. I think that in this particular situation, I would dare to say, and I'm horrified by what I'm about to say, that I would not pull the trigger. That I would side with Monica Dolan's character, because we are losing the propaganda war. Terrorism is more spread than it's ever been. What are we doing wrong? That's what I was hoping a civil conversation here would be about. But for what we have here, does the scenario exist? It's fantasy. Fuck you. Oh, okay. I'm sick of it, honestly. Come on, America. Don't engage me in your political objective and tell me I'm a camel.
I'm actually on your side. I'm not really am. But I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not a pacifist. And neither is Bernie, apparently, since he bought some good. Anyway, good. So we're actually more in sync than we think. Bless you, man. Okay, come on. Anyway, bless you for coming. That was the most spirited evening we've ever had. <laughs> Thank you.